Hi, Peter. Uh, hi, Rob. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, I've got a copy of your book. I picked it up a couple of days ago, uh, The Osama Bin Laden I Know. Um, you'll be happy to know I did not get it from a library. I, I, I paid good money for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no problem. Uh, the, the, the title is, in a certain way, a kind of double entendre, it seems to me. The Osama Bin Laden I Know. Um, what it mainly refers to is the fact that this is uh, an oral history. I mean, you've gone around and talk to just about every accessible person who knows or knew bin Laden in a meaningful way, and you've, you've uh, assembled, assembled uh, the interviews into a, um, a kind of an oral history that, that, that progresses through his life. Um, but the other thing I think of when I see the title, the Osama bin Laden I know, is that you're the only person I know who actually does know Osama bin Laden. I mean, you're not intimate acquaintances, but you've actually made his acquaintance uh, when you were with CNN, uh, you you uh, ventured into his terrain <clears throat> and spent uh, I don't know an hour and a half with him or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, some of the people that I interview in the book are people like myself who just had one meeting or you know, you know, have met Bin Laden sort of uh, incidentally. But of course, even there aren't a lot of number, there aren't a huge number of people in the world who can can make that claim now who aren't in prison. Uh, or you know, or, or even dead, uh, and so yeah. I mean, we I met with him back in '97. I was the producer for his first television interview for CNN. It was the first television interview he'd ever done, and my impressions of him at the time was that he was intelligent, focused, well informed, serious, not really much of a sense of humor, um, and you know, that was just my my <clears throat> kind of immediate take from him. Uh, other people we hear from in the, in the book are, are people who spent, in some cases, years or even decades being his friend. Um, but there, were, there was a way of actually, if I couldn't find somebody, um, there, is a, there was a way that I used in the book, uh, which I thought was a relatively creative way to actually con being, f bring more people into the book than just the ones that are accessible via an interview today. And that, that of course, mm -hmm. involves, you know, Mining Guantanamo Bay transcripts uh, of uh, in transcripts of interrogations uh, from trials around the world. So, you know, court testimony is pretty useful, and so uh, you actually hear from. I think we interviewed, I interviewed, and, and, and a couple of researchers of mine who helped me out in the book. We probably interviewed about 50 people directly, uh, but I think the number of total interviews in the book would probably go up to about 100. Uh, when it's once you throw in all the different cases that we looked at, I mean, there have been one of the reasons the book was a lot easier to write, Bob, after 9 11, paradoxically, was uh, two. Well, I think there were two factors that made it easier to write after 9 11. One, you know, you couldn't really do reporting in any serious manner on Al Qaeda in Saudi Arabia, I don't think, until 2003 when Al Qaeda actually attacked the Saudis directly. Because before mm -hmm. then, people, it, getting a visa was tough, and then even if you did, who would talk to you? I think the Saudis have sort of had a, you know, a sort of come to Jesus moment, as it were, about Al Qaeda, where they are, uh, you know, um, allowing people to do more real research in Saudi in a way that wasn't possible before. Secondly, we've had just a deluge of trials, uh, which have freed up a great deal of uh, interesting court testimony, documents, interrogations, affidavits around the world. One of the most interesting ones uh, occurred in Chicago in the Benevolence International Foundation case in 2002-2003. Uh, that case drew heavily on some documents that were seized in Bosnia in a charity called Benevolence International Foundation oh, right. in, in, in Bosnia. And uh, those, in those, in those uh, documents, you found the founding minutes of al-Qaeda's first meeting, which took place back in, in late August 1988. So yeah, it all comes together into a surprisingly fine-grained narrative, I thought. And well, thank you. I mean, I mean, I love oral history in general because it just seems you can, you can open the book randomly and it, it is engrossing and one reason is that with oral history there's a kind of authenticity that just that really wouldn't be there if you had taken this material and put it in your own words well the other, um, yeah, the, other the, the other thing is i think it does allow the reader to kind of sort of make his or her own judgments to a degree uh, obviously i made Right. You know, I edited these things down yeah and, you select the information but, but nonetheless it, it does i mean there is sort of a um, People can sort of start making their own judgments about about this guy. Um, you know, maybe if I'd written it as a more formal, you know, classic kind of narrative biography, then I would have been in the, put in the position, the interesting position of having to actually come up with my own <laughs> uh, views about him. Uh, and you know, the, the funny thing is, of course, the more you know about something, the more puzzling things become. 
Yeah. Uh, and I don't claim to have found, you know, the kind of uh, the rosebud of the uh, bin Laden story. No, but a lot of things were clarified for me, and I want to ask you about them. First, uh, I, I want to know, is it okay if I show people this picture of you with bin Laden? Of course, yeah. Um, it is, uh, you know, I was looking at this, uh, trying to, whoops, trying to figure out which of the two of you has aged more gracefully, Peter. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you both have very stressful occupations. The... the uh, I guess, of course, we actually have not seen a visual image of him since when? Well, the last videotape we saw of him was October 29, 2004, five days before the U.S. presidential election. Yeah. And he looked pretty good, by the way, in that. He, he looked tanned and rested. Um, he looked uh, better than he's done in years. So the notion that he's sort of suffering some life-threatening illness or really finding... He, he, he seems to be at ease. Yeah, at, 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 at peace with himself, I guess. Well, before we, I, I do want to kind of go quickly through his life and, and hit on a couple of formative influences, but before we do that, I want to ask you one question, which is how important do you think he is right now in the jihadist movement? Well, the conventional wisdom is he's sort of been forgotten and he's out of it and he's not planning operations, and of course there's some truth to that. But I think that's a, it, the conventional wisdom is, is not, it, it might be a little dangerous in the following manner. Ayman al Zawari and bin Laden are, you, you can't understand al-Qaeda or what happened on 9-11 without them. In the same way that it's hard to understand the Holocaust without Hitler, I think it's hard to understand uh, these guys, uh, al-Qaeda, without the two leaders. And, it, you know, so I thought it was a, interesting historically to go back and find out more about him since, you know, there isn't really much out there, really, that's reliable. But secondly, you know, these guys have released more than 35 videotapes and audio tapes between them since 9-11. And these videotapes not only pump up their base, you know, encouraging jihadis around the world to kill Westerners and Jews and, and Americans, but they also have specific strategic tactical advice. For instance, you know, attack President Musharraf, uh, Ayman al-Zawari called for those attacks September 2003, within three, four, three or four months. There were two very serious assassination attempts against President Musharraf. And you think there was a connection there? Well, yeah, because, I mean, from the, from the point of view of the jihadis, you know, when these guys, you know, say things, this is sort of like a religious order. Bin Laden's called repeatedly for attacks on members of the coalition in Iraq. I think that's one of the reasons we had an attack in Madrid, one of the reasons we had an attack in London. Bin Laden's recently called for attacks on Saudi oil, faci oil facilities. I think that's one of the reasons that we saw the attack um, on the large oil facility back uh, a couple of months ago in Saudi. So, you know... They're out there every day. They're out there as a propaganda victory for them, and they actually influence what happens through these videotapes and audio tapes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now, in looking at, at his life, uh, I didn't realize in, in, until I went through your book, uh, two years, you know, of course, uh, in trying to isolate the formative influences on somebody, you know, it's definitely a speculative enterprise. And also, we should make clear, as you do in your, in your book, that to try to understand someone is not to try to excuse their behavior, but um, two years stand out, uh, it seems to me, 1967 and 1979, right? In both of those years, more than one thing happened that was probably influential. In 1967, he was 10 years old, uh, 10 or 11, and, and what's the significance of that year? Well, actually, two things happened that year, both of which were pretty significant. One is his father died, and uh, one doesn't have to be Sigmund Freud to say that may have had some, uh, uh, you know, uh, impact on him. Although, it must be remembered that since his father had 54 kids, uh, you know, it wasn't like a warm and fuzzy family. Uh, Bin Laden probably met with his father in a very formal sense when he was alive, just like all the other kids. Right, but some of the reflections you have in the book uh, of Bin Laden on his father suggest that he did revere him. He revered At him. least in retrospect. Yeah, no, I, there's no doubt about it. The other thing that, of course, what happened in 67 is that the Israelis inflicted a devastating uh, you know, defeat on Egypt, Jordan, and, and Syria in, 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 in the 67 war. And that basically, uh, that started, I think, to a large degree, this Islamic awakening around the Muslim, around, around the Arab world. But it's basically, you know, the secular nationalism and socialism of Nasser and, uh, and, and other uh, like-minded, uh, you know, modernists in the, in the Middle East was really called, called into question by this devastating defeat. And so, you know, Bin Laden, the death of the father, this Islamic awakening, it really catches him as he's a teenager. Uh, one of the things that comes across in the book is how he's almost rather priggish and prurient and uh, uh, fastidious about his religion, even as a young man, as a young teenager. 
And then, you know, you mentioned 79. 79 was an even more... Wait, can, can I just say one thing yeah. on the connection between those two events in 67, his father's death and the uh, 67 war? His father was quite anti-Israel to begin with, right? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a story in the book about Bin Laden's father was a fairly uneducated guy who, you know, built up the biggest construction company in the Middle East, and he asked his engineers at one point, How can we convert our bulldozers into tanks? Uh, you know, we've got 250 bulldozers. Can we kind of get engaged in the, uh, in the Israeli war? I mean, but, you know, I think anti-Israeli feelings in that region uh, are pretty ubiquitous, and so Bin Laden's father was no more probably anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist uh, than, than, than much of his generation, but I think that was certainly communicated to his son. Okay, and then uh, 1979, uh, a few things happen, right? Yeah, it's the you know the Ayatollah Khomeini comes back, uh, you know, getting rid of the Shah in Iran. You have the takeover of the mosque in Mecca of the Holy of Holies by a group of Islamic militants. Uh, Sadat makes peace with Israel, and of course, Afghanistan invades. Uh, Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. So 70, and also 79, by the way, Bob was the beginning of an Islamic century. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a difference between the Islamic calendar and the, uh, the Western calendar. And it, uh, the beginnings of new centuries are always seen as uh, important changes. So all these things happen at the same time. Now, Bin Laden's 22. He's already, we've already established that he's a very religious teenager or, uh, who's you know, praying seven times a day and you know, fasting twice a week and doing all these extra things and really trying to imitate the Prophet Muhammad. So all these things happen when he's 22. And you can imagine what it would have been like for him to see all these things happen at once. Suddenly, you know, you've got an Islamic regime which has overthrown a... A, a uh, you know the the Shah of Iran. You've got a godless infidels invading a, a sovereign Muslim nation in Afghanistan. You've got a peace agreement with the hated Israel. All these things. I can't really tell you exactly how they affected him, but my intuition is they affected him deeply. And certainly, of course, he then voted with his feet and his wallet uh, after the Soviet invasion and, and went to Afghanistan and Pakistan to help out. Yeah, and I get the sense in looking at that that. Um you know, on the one hand, he seems not by nature a self-promoter. He seems to, he comes across as a shy guy fundamentally, and yet he seems to have been aware from early on that, you know, he went and fought and, and, and fought in a serious way uh, in, in Afghanistan, but, but, but part of the agenda from fairly early on was to get publicity for the fighting, right? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing because one of the things that everybody says about the 22-year-old, 24-year-old, 25-year-old Bin Laden was he's shy, modest, retiring, almost monosyllabic. And yet at the same time, he sets up an Arab military force, even before al-Qaeda, to take on the Soviets directly. Now, from a strategic point of view, this made no sense at all. Uh, one of the things that Bin Laden did was set up a base very near a Soviet uh, military outpost. He was asked why uh, by one of the people in the book, and uh, he says, well, to attract enemy fire. Now, as a military strategy, that's about as dumb as you get, as it can get. And it's part of a, by one of the themes I'm trying to make in the book is that Bin Laden, you know, he thinks strategically, but often he gets it wrong. Uh, and so, much against the advice of his friends and family, he set up this Arab military force, and suddenly he begins to have the courage of his own convictions. And this shy retiring guy begins sort of basically ignoring other people's advice. And ra even as early as 87, uh, begins inviting uh, Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, for instance, who's now in Washington as the media advisor to Prince Turkey, the ambassador from Saudi to the United States. At that time, a journalist for a you know, mainstream Arabic uh, newspaper, and Bin Laden invites him to Afghanistan, Khashoggi covers it, and at that point you suddenly got you know, some mainstream coverage of, uh, of Bin Laden in the, uh, the Arab media which I think turns him into kind of a celebrity. And I think despite the fact that Bin Laden is a shy and retiring guy on some levels, he, as one of the people in the book, got the, got the disease as sort of the, uh, the flash bulb. And uh, he admired, you know, he basically does want a lot of public attention. One of the things the Taliban kept telling him was stop giving all these incendiary interviews attacking the United States. It's interfering with our ability to get that diplomatic recognition. And Osama basically ignored all that. Huh. Well, of course, the other thing is, I mean, even aside from possibly enjoying the publicity himself, he had his own agenda that actually didn't strictly coincide probably with either the agenda of the Taliban or the agenda of various other radicals, right? I mean, yeah. uh, that was, a, you know, his agenda be became distinctive at some time. In fact, there's a mentor of his who was reasonably radical. I forget his name. Abdul Razak. But they had a parting of the ways because he wasn't radical enough for bin Laden because he didn't want Muslims to fight Muslims, whereas bin Laden's feeling was you not only 
you not in the long run we're not only in conflict with formerly Muslim na lands now under Western rule or whatever, but we're we're going to be at conflict with places like Saudi Arabia where it is yeah, under Muslim leadership, but not uh, Muslim leadership of the of the kind we like, right? Basically, yeah. I mean, it's a Saudi Qutub idea, which is that. Um, you know, if there are Muslim regimes not or not ruling in a Muslim way, they are in a, living in a state of jalalia, ignorance, pagan ignorance, and the implication of which is you can overthrow them. And of course, that was the idea of Ayman al Zawari imbibed, uh, transferred to Bin Laden. Bin Laden, who had, you know, was basically a friend of the Saudi royal family in the late 80s, really begins to change uh, in the 1990 period. Hmm. So it's not until then, I see, that, that, that his agenda is that distinctive. Well, it, it, he's drawing away, or by even, even in 86, just the idea of setting up his own Arab military force, was, that was rejected by his mentor, Abdullah Razam, who was assassinated in Peshawar in Pakistan in 89. Razam mm -hmm. basically wanted you know, you know, to return formerly Muslim nations to Muslim hands, whether they were in Andalusia or the former public republics of the, of the Soviet Union. But he did not, as you say want to you know, get involved in overthrowing Middle Eastern regimes. That was a much more radical idea that was really an Egyptian idea that came out of the jihad group. I see. Now, okay, so he goes to Afghanistan, he gets a lot of attention, he becomes a higher profile person. Um, one story you hear is that he had a kind of uh, epiphany, I've read this in newspapers, when he I mean, the, the, the Persian Gulf War deposited American troops in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't know what kind of military presence we had had there before, but anyway, it, it, they became very conspicuous if they'd been there before at all. One story you read, I read in the newspapers is he had a kind of epiphany, and I had gathered that that happened after he came back from Afghanistan, and he, you know, he saw infidel troops uh, in the Holy Land and decided this is unacceptable. How, how much uh, does that correspond with reality at all? Well, I mean, he, it, was, it was a sort of uh, St. Paul on the road to Damascus epiphany, but it wasn't quite an epiphany because bin Laden, by his own account, had, had turned against the United States after the Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982, uh, an invasion that bin Laden felt couldn't have happened without U.S. blessing. And, in fact, in the 80s, bin Laden was not drinking Pepsi or Coke or Sprite, and he was advocating a boycott of American goods, which parenthetically makes the whole argument that he was sort of a CIA creation kind of nonsensical and this guy has been anti-American, uh, since he's been a young man. But that anti-Americanism turned into real hatred with the uh, arrival of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia. But he'd already began to turn against the Saudi regime. He wanted, interestingly, Bob, to intervene in the, in the, in the north and south Yemen. Southern Yemen had a socialist government, and northern, northern Yemen was more of a secular government. He wanted to intervene in, in the 1990 period and uh, basically send his troops to defeat the socialists in southern Yemen. And this basically pissed off the Saudi government because they didn't want you know, bin Laden to be running some sort of private foreign policy. And of course at the time the Saudis sort of an un, a, dis, an, a, 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 a divided Yemen on the southern border was not such a bad thing. A, 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 a united Yemen might not serve Saudi strategic interests. So even before the American troops arrived in Saudi Arabia, bin Laden was getting really on the outs of the Saudi government. They were thinking that this guy needed to be kind of controlled in some manner. Okay. So um, then, uh, so so so, he's he's now a, 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 an increasingly prominent figure, but he doesn't really. It's not until shortly before your interview with him in 1997 that he really makes it onto the radar screen. In, in fact, I think you said that that when you interviewed him, you, so far as you can recall, you had never seen a picture of him, right? There may have been one picture, but I mean, certainly, you know, I really didn't have any idea what he would be, what he looked like. Um, and, and, and he had just only like about a year ago, we had started hearing about him in the West, or a year before 1997. Yeah, I mean, the State Department produced a white paper in August of '96, which was actually, you know, fairly. Uh, you know, quite a comprehensive look. It, it portrayed him as an Islamic financier of uh, extremist movements, but it didn't portray him necessarily as a terrorist mastermind, uh, but it certainly got him on the radar screen. Actually, funnily enough, the person who wrote the first story about bin Laden that really got me interested in it was Judy Miller and Jeff Gerf uh, huh. back in uh, August of 96. And I got interested in it. I was living in New York in the 80s, and you know, I, I traveled to Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, several occasions before, and... and, and uh, I, when the first trade center, ha happened, uh, trade center attack happened in February of 93, it was pretty obvious this wasn't just a bunch of disaffected cab drivers from Brooklyn who got together. They clearly had an organization 
And this organization had, everybody in that group had one thing in common. They'd either been to Afghanistan or they were related to this Afghan refugee center, so-called, which was really al-Qaeda's branch office in the United States in Brooklyn. And so when Bin Laden's name surfaced, I went to my boss at CNN and I said, look, there seems to be an organization here. The organization appears to have a leader. His name is Bin Laden. Of course, they didn't know Bin Laden from Shmin Laden. But they, uh, they kind of trusted my judgment that it might be worth pursuing. And I went over to London and spent a lot of time with his media advisor and a group of people who basically you know, knew Bin Laden one way or another and got the interview. Okay. And, uh, and was it during your interview that he first formally, or well, not formally, but officially kind of declared war on the United States in, in a fashion that probably seemed melodramatic at the time? <laughs> Well, he, he kind of declared war in August of 96, uh, okay. but that was in the Arab press. I mean, this was the first time he told reporters that he was planning to attack the West. We asked him, when you say you're planning to attack the United States, what do you mean? Is it U.S. military, U.S. civilians, who are the targets? And he basically said, U.S. military targets, if civilians get in the way, that's their sort of problem. So at that time, it was more narrowly focused. Obviously, by the time the U.S. embassies had attacks happened in Africa, you know, Basically, any, anybody was on the list, including, including Muslim civilians. One of the things that we kind of didn't get right with the embassy bombing attacks was to point out in a very public manner that you know, al-Qaeda had killed more Muslim civilians in those attacks than Americans. And, of course, mm -hmm. this is one of the Achilles' heels of these groups. Okay. And so it was the, the USS Cole and the, the two African embassy bombings in between your interview and 9-11. Now, during your interview, he listed his grievances, right? And, they both, uh, yeah, and, they, and, and first and foremost was the presence of American troops in the Holy Land, in, in his Holy indeed. Land. Indeed, and he didn't mention Madonna or homosexuality or Hollywood or feminism or drugs or alcohol. So American culture was not the problem. Uh, as, as Bin Laden himself said, if that was the problem, why didn't I attack Sweden? So uh, it's, it's about our foreign policies. Now, there is an, an argument has been made that some Bin Laden latched onto the Palestinian issue late in the game, which I think is nonsense. I mean, you've got to put yourself in the mindset of these guys. Then one of the stories in the book is how Mohammed bin Laden, the father, was able to pray uh, both in Mecca, Medina, and in Jerusalem at the dome of the, uh, at the, uh, you know, the site there in Jerusalem, obviously before the 67 war, uh, because he had a plane and a helicopter could carry him around. These people he are, did those on the same day sometimes, on the, right? On the same day. So, you know, right. a, you know bin Laden in, imbibed the Palestinian issue with his mother's milk. What happened was the Palestinian issue became more important after the Second Intifada, which began in 2000. So when we talked to him, the issue, the hierarchy, as far as I could tell, was U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia, U.S. support for Israel, uh, the sanctions on Iraq, and U.S. support for Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which are not sufficiently Islamic. And, of course, the hierarchy's changed over time. Obviously, we've taken our troops out of Saudi Arabia, and that hasn't stopped him uh, from these attacks. Uh, but I, I think the notion that he, he got on the Palestinian issue uh, late in the game uh, is just one of those things which just isn't true. Ayman al-Zawari has pointed out in his Nights Under the Banners of the Prophet, his, his autobiography, that the Palestinian issue is useful because even secularists can get around it. You know, even people who are Arab nationalists or not even Muslims who live in the Arab world who are Christians uh, can have strong feelings about Palestine, the Palestinian issue. So, yes, uh, Ayman al-Zawari is emphasizing it more, but the notion is just a convenient hobby horse for bin Laden. I don't buy that. Okay. And do you pronounce that Zawahari? Isn't it spelled Zawahiri Zaw or not? Zawahiri, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the, I mean, because I, 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 I've so wrestled with the distinguishing him from Zarqawi, like a lot of Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I finally had it right. The, um, and, and this was uh, bin Laden's, uh, Zawahiri was his lieutenant. I, I heard him referred to once as bin Laden's brain because he's a pretty cerebral guy. And bin Laden, though not stupid, is a lot of people would say not brilliant, right? Well, I mean, the conventional wisdom is that Sawahiri is the brains of the movement, and, you know, certainly he's a bright guy, he speaks excellent English, he's a surgeon by training, he comes from a prominent Egyptian family, but, you know, Bin Laden is going to be 50 shortly, it's not like he needs somebody else to tell him what to do, and they, they basically, basically, they've had a perfect symbiosis. Sawahiri, if Bin Laden died tomorrow, Sawahiri would not be an effective leader of the al-Qaeda movement. He's, even within the Egyptian militant movement, he's not regarded as a really serious leader. Osama Bin Laden clearly has some sort of charisma and leadership skills, uh, mm -hmm. What Bin Laden gave Zawahiri was money, uh, a, an attractive backstory for the leader, a uh, proven leadership abilities that Zawahiri doesn't have. Zawahiri gave Bin Laden uh, some ideas, uh, a, a group, the Jihad group, who had had some experience. Zawahiri, when Bin Laden met him back in 86, had already spent three years in Egyptian prison, had actually run a jihadist cell in Egypt at age 15. So, you know, that would have been impressive to Bin Laden. They needed each other. Uh, it's worked out pretty well for both of them. Um, uh, but I don't, you know, in fact, 
if you reading my book, it's, talking to the people who I interviewed in the book, it becomes clear that actually it was Bin Laden who told Zawahiri that we should start attacking the far enemy of the United States. Zawahiri was really focused on overthrowing the Egyptian government. Bin Laden's analysis, which I think is proven rather a false one, is that if you attack the United States, somehow this will destabilize the authoritarian regimes. You know, this sounds like a good idea on paper, but in practice, attacking the United States, you know, introduced uh, American armies into Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, has actually strengthened these authoritarian regimes because they understand that, uh, that we need them in the fight against al-Qaeda. Okay, so, yeah, let's get into that, Afghanistan and Iraq and the, and the effects. Now, after the Afghanistan war, I gather there was a pretty widespread feeling, uh, according to you, I, I've gathered this, or, or a somewhat widespread feeling within the jihadi movement that actually 9-11 had been a strategic mistake. Yes, that is a counter counterintuitive conclusion that the book comes to, is that a number of the jihadists I spoke to and al-Qaeda insiders who are writing very publicly about this, one of the sort of parenthetical lessons of this book, I think, is that open source information is the best form of information. It's subject to continuous peer review. We've seen with secret information that is so often it's nonsensical, and somehow people put more trust in secret information than what's open. And rarely have our enemies told us so often about what their plans are, what their disputes are. You know, Bin Laden went on CNN to say he was declaring war on the United States. He didn't do it secretly. And what's really interesting about the debate about 9-11 is playing out in the, in the, in the, in the newspapers like al Shauk al Awsat or uh, Al-Hayat, uh, Al-Qaeda insiders saying this was a mistake, we had a good thing going, you know, the Taliban were the only modern Islamic state that was destroyed, Al-Qaeda was destroyed, Bin Laden did the worst thing, which is believing his own propaganda, that the United States is a paper tiger. He based that analysis on our pullout from Beirut in 83 and our pullout from Mogadishu in 93. We're not going to pull out of Washington or, or New York, <laughs> quite clearly. And uh, uh, bin Laden completely misunderestimated, to use the President Bush's, and what our uh, response was going to be. Um, Although he seems to have anticipated uh, that we might invade Afghanistan to get him, because is not he the one, or do we know whether he's the one who assassinated Massoud, if that's his name, the very formidable Afghan warlord uh, with whom you also have your, your picture uh, in, in, this, in this book? Yes. Um, well, I, I had assumed that that was uh, to prepare for our retaliation for 9-11. Am I wrong? Well, I mean, could have been, but I think it was principally a sort of a form of a sort of pourboire or tip to the Taliban because Osama certainly didn't clear clue the Taliban in about his plans. And so, you know, I think he knew that they might be kind of aggrieved about this 9-11 attack given the fact hmm. that that was going to interfere with their quest for diplomatic recognition. And so by killing Massoud, that was sort of a, a, a kind of gift to Mullah Omar. Hmm, I see, I see. Okay, so now this question of whether 9-11 was a mistake. After the Afghanistan war, uh, you're saying a lot of people in, in, on bin Laden's side felt it had been. Now, what about the Iraq war? And at this point, you may have to distinguish between its implications for al-Qaeda and its implications for the jihadi movement writ large. I don't know. It, get, it starts getting kind of complicated. Uh, and, and for that matter, al-Qaeda starts getting complicated because... <laughs> Now you've got Zawahiri and bin Laden presumably not in the same place, uh, and, and they're sending out publicity separately. And then you've got this guy Zarqawi, who now is under the al-Qaeda umbrella, although, contrary to what Donald Rumsfeld implied only a few days ago, Zarqawi was not affiliated with al-Qaeda uh, before 9-11, before in fact, not, not before the Iraq War, right? Well, let me pick up on that point because it's an important one. I think you know, one of the interviews, well, it's not an interview, one of the things that I found in the book which was quite useful was the very extensive interrogation of a guy called Shadi Abdullah who was in German custody, and he was part of Zakawi's group. Uh, Zakawi's group in the pre-9-11 period was based in Britain, Germany, and Jordan. And that interrogation has a lot of information about what Zakawi's group really was about, their relationship with al-Qaeda. And it turns out their relationship with al-Qaeda was somewhat competitive uh, and, and, also, and on occasion cooperative, but competitive about money, about strategy, about people. Uh, you know, Zakawi wanted to overthrow the Jordanian government. Uh, al-Qaeda wanted to attack the United States. Zakawi had no part of that uh, plan, at least initially. He actually had a separate training camp in Afghanistan in Iraq, in Western Afghanistan, which is about as far as you can get geographically from the Al-Qaeda central area in Kandahar, uh, several hundred miles. So he wanted to do his own thing. Uh, certainly he met with uh, bin Laden at one point, uh, but he was doing his own thing. He had his own organization, 
uh, which was separate and distinct. And then, of course, after the fall of the Taliban, he went into Iran. He spent more time in Iran uh, than any other country before he went to Iraq. And he went into Iraq basically because, he, you know, at that point he wanted to try and attack Americans. But, uh, you know, if you go back to Colin Powell's statements before the United Nations, everything that he said in that, state, in that statement turned out to be false. Uh, and the relationship that he was positing between Zakawi and as being the kind of you know, missing link between Saddam and al-Qaeda, it's just it's really nonsense. Right. I mean, to the extent that he was spending time in Iraq, wasn't a lot of it in a part of Iraq that Saddam Hussein didn't control? And then if he yeah, visited it was, Baghdad, it, it, it was like for medical it was, treatment or something? It, it was, well, the, the medical treatment story, I think, was nonsense. Because you, you, oh. you may remember, Bob, that it was about a missing leg. Well, yeah, I think in the last videotape we just saw with Zakawi, he seemed to be pretty active on both legs. So he, mm. he obviously wasn't missing a leg. The medical treatment, I think, turned out to be, you know, no one has ever proved, by the way, interestingly, how these stories never really get followed up. Um, you know, there are hospital records in Iraq. You know, that no journalist has found, you know, a, we know what his real name is. One of the, the actually, in, in the paperback version of this book, which is going to come out later in this year, uh, there's a fascinating document that got released by West Point in which um, it's a, the Mukhabarat the in Iraq. They, they're saying, apparently we have a couple of al-Qaeda guys in our country, and one of them is, you know, this guy Zakari. They use his real name. Let's go and try and find these guys. Now, that's kind of an interesting document. If, if these guys are supposed to be in, <laughs> this is the secret police trying to find their alleged ally somewhere in the country. You know, it, 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 one of the interesting things about the documents that are being released by, by, the, by DOD right now uh, is that we have ten, you know, millions and millions of documents being recovered in Iraq, hundreds of thousands in Afghanistan. And believe me, if there was a smoking gun for proving this Zakawi al Qaeda link before 9 11 or Saddam al Qaeda link, well, we'd know about it. And there isn't. Okay, so that was a major and consequential piece of misinformation that was posited um, by the administration. I mean, isn't it also the case that before we invaded Iraq, more of Zarqawi's energy was directed against Jordan than against American interests? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he wanted to basically to overthrow the Jordanian government and attack Israeli, Jew, Israeli and Jewish targets. Interestingly, his spiritual advisor, the, main, the guy he needed sanctioned from operations, wasn't in al-Qaeda. He was a guy called Abu Qadada. He's a Jordanian cleric who was living in London since 93. So... This, this group had a sort of European and Jordanian dimension. Uh, but going back to the question of uh, the 9-11 being a strategic uh, uh, failure for al-Qaeda, one of the people, one of the persons who had this analysis was one of bin Laden's older sons, Omar, who actually left him in disgust after 9-11, saying that was a dumb idea. Hmm. And uh, then, of course, Iraq war comes along. If we had this conversation a year after 9-11, Bob, it would be much more positive than the one we're about to have, because... You know, I've just been back in Afghanistan twice in the last several months. The place is going really south in a quite dramatic manner. I well, mean, I remember you saying um, a year or two ago that things seemed under control in Afghanistan. You had just been there. Well, I was taking the optimistic view, and there were reasons to yeah. be cheerful. Um, you know, three million refugees have returned, uh, parliamentary election, presidential election, Hamid Karzai, unlike Shalabi, is a very popular guy in Afghanistan. You know, sometimes we pick the right person, and Karzai was an example of the right person. But now, you know, the security situation, suicide attacks are very effective in terms of getting people to, get, uh, to leave places, closing down reconstruction, making journalism difficult, uh, the whole tenor of the place is different. And so, you know, Afghanistan is, is not going well. You know, part of one of the conventional wisdoms I'm opposed to is the notion that obviously al-Qaeda, the organization, has taken a huge number of hits and has become more al-Qaeda the ideological movement. But if you look at what's actually happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan, al-Qaeda looks pretty alive and well. They're training suicide attackers, uh, many of them Pakistanis, to go over into Afghanistan. Uh, they've nearly killed the, you know, the president twice. Uh, they killed an American diplomat outside the consulate in Karachi just recently. Uh, they've attacked French defense workers. They've killed other American diplomats. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty lively group. And... One of the things that uh, I, I think if you look at the London attacks, I think the, more, the British government just released a report saying that there's not much indication that it, this had anything to do with al-Qaeda. I think they're misunderstanding a very important piece of evidence. The lead attacker in the London attack did a suicide video, which I don't think he, he didn't record in Leeds. He recorded in Pakistan with a group called al-Sahab, which is the video production arm of al-Qaeda. And al-Sahab's stamp is on this videotape, and somehow the British investigators overlooked this rather critical fact. This tape must be made by people in al-Qaeda. This lead attacker must have hooked up with elements of al-Qaeda. 
And so while the argument that al-Qaeda is you know, really, really damaged is true, uh, there seems to be a minor resurgence. And, and that, you know, what's going on in Afghanistan and, on, and in Waziristan and Pakistan, uh, I think, is reasonably good evidence of that. Okay. But it does seem to me um, the Iraq war for al-Qaeda per se, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced that the Iraq war has been a, a big blunder for America and has, has made life either easier for the jihadist movement writ large. But for bin Laden, it seems like it's been kind of a mixed blessing in the sense that, I mean, he decided that, okay, it made sense to form an alliance with Zarqawi, and, and they made a formal affiliation and, and brought him, uh, extended the al-Qaeda brand to him. But um, Zarqawi's strategy of kind of viciously attacking Shiites, uh, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, bin Laden's original intention to start uh, this sectarian war within Islam, right? I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think there are several reasons for that. One is that you know, bin Laden privately may think the Shia are heretics, but he, you know, he wants to sort of speak for all Muslims. Secondly, a number of quite senior al-Qaeda leaders, including one of his sons, Saad bin Laden, actually live in Iran. And they're sort of on, on, on ice right now, living in a, some form of ha house custody. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't think bin Laden's, you know, it's really interesting. But we've got a lot of stuff on the public record from bin Laden. He's never criticized Iran. He's never critici criticized Shia. So, so now we have these letters from Zawahiri to Zakawi basically saying, you know, don't provoke a Sunni Shia civil war. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and also saying enough with the beheadings, you know. And in fact, Zakawi has. And they have stopped, right? They have stopped. videotaped the beheadings. In fact, and, you know, that new videotape of, bin La of Zakawi is sort of the kind of gentler Zakawi, if that can be imagined. Uh, yeah. You know, instead of standing over a victim yeah, with a, a hood. A guy who doesn't know how to operate a machine gun. Um, well, it turns out that's a saw American mach machine gun, which is. Um, not that easy to operate, uh, ah. particularly if it's not sort of part of your, I don't know, so who knows. But, mm -hmm. but Zakawi, look, Zakawi is a very effective guy, and one of the themes of, the, of my book uh, towards the end is, is the question of blowback from the Iraq war, because that's going to be, we, we've already run this videotape once before in Afghanistan, we know what the blowback looked like. It was the first Trade Center attack in 93 leading up to 9-11 with all the attacks in between. So the, the blowback from the Iraq war could be very, very nasty for several reasons. First of all, the foreign fighters in Iraq are fighting the world's best army, as, a, as opposed to the, one of the world's worst armies, the Soviet conscripts that bin Laden was fighting in the 80s. Bin Laden was fighting a guerrilla war. He wasn't doing, engaging in acts of, of terrorism in the sense that Zakari is, suicide attacks, uh, IED stuff that could be really easily reapplied to other urban conflicts. And a story that really interests me is when you've got a Belgian female conducting suicide operations in Iraq, as we saw on November 9, 2005, we're in a very different world. There's a Harvard uh, researcher called Asaf Mongadin who's aptly titled this, The Globalization of Martyrdom. And I think, it, let, let's posit that the Iraq war, or wars, because I think there'll be a series of wars, goes on for something between six to eight to ten years. We're going to see so many jihadists cycling through that region. Not all of them are going to have one-way tickets. Some of them are going to you know, survive this conflict with some pretty serious set of skills. And they were already conducting suicide operations outside the country. The very same day the Belgian female uh, conducted a suicide operation, she'd been recruited for, with her husband to come from Belgium to Iraq, a country she'd never been to before. They also launched an attack on three American-owned hotels in Amman, Jordan, Zakawi's group. So this uh, shows that Zakawi's actually you know, he's, he's reaching out outside the country to recruit people. At the same time, he's sending people on suicide missions in, in neighboring countries. Yeah, it, it seems to me that Iraq, precisely because going up against American forces really has forced them to innovate, I mean, Iraq has become kind of a graduate school for terrorists. It, it's advanced training, and haven't we, uh, I think I've read, that techniques developed in Iraq have already been sent back to Afghanistan and deployed by terrorists there, right? Well, indeed, and in fact, when I was there before Christmas, I was asking NATO commanders, who are doing these suicide hikes in Afghanistan? Are these copycats from Iraq? And they, they said that we don't really know. Carl and the New York Times demonstrated that uh, it seems to be a number of them are Pakistanis who have been trained on the, PAC, on the Afghan PAC border. But when I was just there three weeks ago, there were stories in the Afghan newspapers, the irony of which hardly needs underlining, that there was some evidence of people training in Iraq to fight in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, and as a rule, these uh, doesn't Afghanistan, the experience in Afghanistan after the Soviet Union suggests that as a rule, when the war is over, these people, you know, don't, don't go to business school or something. I mean, they stay in the terrorist business by and large. Yeah. There's something about the lifestyle 
that is addictive or, or, or something about the foreclosed alternatives or something, but a lot of them stay in the business, right? Indeed, and maybe because it's fun or maybe because they believe they're doing God's will, but, uh, you know, they don't, they don't go home and open coffee shops. They tend to become the ne next generation of jihadi shop troops. Okay. Um, what... Uh, well, actually, I have, a, I have a specific question about one, one place. I mean, I mean, you know, again, it, it's the line between al-Qaeda and the larger jihadist movement gets fuzzy, and then the whole question of what is an affiliate of al-Qaeda gets fuzzy. One thing that's been in the news recently is Somalia. Apparently, Washington is covertly supporting warlords who uh, are fighting uh, this, these... Uh, this Islamic or Islamist maybe movement that is alleged to have ties to Al Qaeda. At least that seems to be the conviction of the United States. I mean, are, are they right at least to that extent? Well, or you know, do you know, Bob? I, I think it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, as you know, some, I mean, uh, one of our colleagues, a new American, Neil Rosen, who's uh, one of the more courageous reporters uh, on the planet. Yeah, you know, he went to Somalia, and he said Somalia really frightened him. So one of the problems about this question is. Who, who's really, you know, what independent reporting are we really getting on this question? It is a fact that Al Qaeda was in Somalia in the 93, 94 time period. Uh, they had links with this group, who I'm going to mangle their name, but it's called the Ittihad, uh, the Islamic Union uh, of Somalia, I think it is. So, you know, and, and certainly um, if you look at some of bin Laden's most recent statements about Darfur, uh, and how Western intervention there is part of the plan to sort of take over ever bigger chunks of the Muslim world. They sort of feel the same way about Somalia. Uh, it's somewhere where they've had historical roots. Uh, we saw, by the way, in the London attacks, in, in the second wave of London attacks, July 21st, uh, two weeks after the first wave, were conducted by Somalis. So this, to me, you know, I, I think there might well be uh, some truth to this, but my, I'm, I'm skeptical on the, in, only in the sense that Where's the independent reporting? It's just too dangerous to do it right now. So we, it, it's not clear to you anyway that, that backing these warlords is a good idea. I mean, assuming there could be some blowback from it, which there usually is. It's, it's, it, I mean, you're, you're kind of genuinely agnostic on the point right now. You just, we just I, can't I, say. I just don't know. Uh -huh. um, and what about, uh, I mean, how, how does uh, now we're, we're however many years past, five years past 9-11 almost, what, what's, your, what's your line on this, uh, on the Clash of Civilizations thesis that, that, that predated 9-11 but got all this airtime because, because of 9-11? I mean, do you, do you think well, that's... You know, you know what, what, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, way of actually calibrating this. And if you look at the pro-Bin Laden dem demonstrations immediately after 9-11 in Karachi and Jakarta, you know, where you can have a million-man uh, march at the drop of a hat, the, the pro-Bin Laden demonstrators were, you know, 30,000 people. They were small. The anti-Iraq war uh, demonstrations in the lead-up to the Iraq war in the same city were massive, and they were massive around the world. I'm very suspicious sort of on a philosophical level about that we're in a clash of civilizations because I think if we really were, we'd be, you know, Norman Potteretz would be right, we really would be in World War IV. We're clearly not in World War IV. We're in a conflict with a small group of people who can do us some damage, but in their wildest dreams, that would be a radiological bomb attack in a major American or European city as they presently stand. So I... I think, but I've got to say, with the Danish cartoon riots, uh, uh, I began to sort of, sort of say, well, maybe the, maybe I need to reassess this. In fact, uh, I think uh, New America and, and NYU in, in the fall are going to do a big conference about the question of, you know, is there really a clash of, uh, of civilizations? Uh, because I think you, just to be intellectually honest, I think you've got to ask yourselves after the Danish cartoon protests. You know, there are clearly some things that we basically really disagree on, uh, kind of rather fundamentally. Uh, it, you know, classic Western liberals, and uh, and 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 and, and, and where the, what was interesting about the cartoon riots, I thought, Bob, was that you know the United States acted in such a kind of measured way. I mean, CNN, an organization I work for, you know, we didn't broadcast the images. And you know, what's interesting about this country is you can say whatever you want, but there are kind of social constraints based on civility to prevent you from publishing things that might be offensive to other groups. And I think that's true of societies that are built on immigration are more sensitive to these things, even though technically we can say whatever we want. Somehow there is a self-censorship, and I don't think that's a bad thing. And no, I, don't, I wrote an op-ed piece in this context saying it's not a bad thing and at fact, all, and maybe Bob, we should Bob, try Bob, to export this norm worldwide. I, Bob, I think, I think I'm just merely parodying exactly what you said now I think about it. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the kind to point out that... Uh, 
but it, but it, but it's it, you know. And the other thing I took away from that thing was how, you know, we, you know, the Europeans almost seem to take pleasure in sort of a screw you attitude about publishing these things. It's not it's not like they just published one or two. It was sort of it was almost intended to incite. No, that, the whole the, this whole editors this Danish editors initiative to have this context had very much that feel about it. Let's piss them off. Well, you know, this might be quite dangerous because I went back uh, for them, unfortunately, and I, I, I take no joy in any of the, what, what I'm about to say or what has happened. But if you go back and you look at Bin Laden's most recent statement and you read the whole thing, it's actually a 50 minute. You know, what, what happens with these statements is that Al Jazeera, which is by the conventional wisdom of Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera is mostly wrong somehow that they're an Al Qaeda mouth. This is a complete nonsense. These are a group of professional journalists interested in, in, in basically doing news. And the Al Qaeda people don't like Al Jazeera because they feel like they censor this, a lot of stuff. In fact, what Al Jazeera does is they just broadcast what they consider the newsy bits. But if you look at the whole text, which was then released on jihadist websites, it's mostly about the Danish cartoon controversy. And as I read it, I said, wow, this looks a lot like the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Because it was a really, it was Bin Laden really calling for people responsible for these cartoons to be, to be attacked and killed. And it's something that I think is not being really covered. Uh, uh, these statements, as I've indicated earlier, you know, actually can lead to results. And it would not be entirely surprising to me that there might be some group of people somewhere in the Middle East reading those statements saying, oh, I think our, our patriotic duty or our religious duty is going to attack the people who publish these cartoons. And we saw after the Salman Rushdie fact where the Japanese publisher got killed, a number of people got killed who were associated with publishing the book. Well, right. And, and that's why, I mean, it seems to me the clash of civilizations thing was kind of neither true nor false intrinsically five years ago. There are things we can do to make it more real or make it less real. This Danish editor probably <laughs> made it a little more real. Although you're right, there, there, there is a latent split in worldview that he brought to the surface. But he didn't. He kind of didn't have to. And the, I mean, more fundamentally, I guess I would say that if you look at another thing, you know, probably it may well be that if it hadn't been for the Iraq War and a couple of other incendiary things, the cartoon thing wouldn't have had enough valence to get going. I mean, I, we don't know. And it seems to me the Iraq War is an example of, uh, I mean, I've always thought that the clash of civilizations was in danger of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, if you see the world as us against them, uh, so that every, you know, every country you look at, you kind of think you see this jihadist movement that has to be attacked. And, and Iraq it was the, the example in this case. Um, that, you know, we thought there was this, this connection to the jihadist movement that had to be attacked. So we went and we attacked it. Our premises were wrong, but but if you do that enough, it has the effect of creating a more globally unified jihadist movement than there was before you acted on the premise of the clash of civilizations. Do you see? Does that make sense? It does. And of course, the biggest fan of the clash of civilizations is Osama bin Laden. You know, he's a, sure um, because he believes that his version of Islam will win. But certainly, we played into that narrative with the Iraq War. I mean, if you think about the George Kennan's strategy, containment basically, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, relied on the insight that communism was a fairly bad set of ideas that would basically implode and obviously we didn't want to directly fight these guys. So what would a philosophy, I mean I'm interested in the question of like what is a strategy of containing this thing? Well certainly do first do no harm would be part of it. I mean invading Iraq stirred this virus up and dispersed it and will continue to disperse it for some time. But I think we also have to look beyond the Iraq war because obviously right now that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. But I mean, we've got to be thinking 10, 20 years out. I mean, how do we really deal with this? Um, and, and, and a lot of it may be uh, some things that we can do. Uh, for instance, our help in the tsunami in Indonesia really transformed uh, attitudes about the United States and Indonesia. Our help in Pakistan has really helped our image there after the earthquake in Kashmir. You know, closing Guantanamo, ending renditions, putting people on trial. There are a lot of little things we can do. But at the very end of the day, you know, we've got to sort of, you know, to some degree let this all be sorted out in the Muslim world. I think that these groups have two key problems. The Al-Qaeda's, they, they kill a lot of Muslim civilians. That's something that's very hard to oppress our advantage on because we're also killing Muslim civilians in Iraq. But this is a huge Achilles heel for these groups because it's very, that's why Zakawi got the letter from Zahar Zawahiri saying enough with the beheadings. He's killing <laughs> civilians. Uh, and also, they don't have a positive vision. I mean, one of the reasons we won the Cold War, we kind of like presented a better picture uh, to uh, you know to people who were on the swing voters or on the fence about which way to go. And I think that you know 
there was ways of improving the picture we presented to the outside world. Even President Bush is saying we should close Guantanamo, or it's, it should happen. Uh, but uh, they don't, you know, we know what bin Laden's against, but what's he really for? You know, he's sort of for a caliphate. What does that mean? In practice, the likelihood of the caliphate coming back is like the Holy Roman Empire re emerging in Europe. I mean, it's not going to happen, it's a rhetorical device. But I think most Muslims kind of get it. They don't want to live in a Taliban style theocracy from Indonesia to Morocco. And in the longer term, that's also going to do these groups in because, um, um, you know, we've, there was an interesting poll in Saudi Arabia where Saudis were asked what they thought of bin Laden. 50% 50 of them had a favorability rating for bin Laden, you know, thinking he's a good guy two years ago or so. And when they, when they were asked, do you want to live in a bin Laden run society, only 5% said yes. And I think that gets to a really important, to put a larger strategic point about this whole thing, which is that bin Laden is admired basically because he stuck it to the West to boil it down. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people want to live in, in bin Laden or Taliban-run style theocracies. I think there's a silent majority in the Muslim world who kind of gets it, that that's not a very attractive. I mean, if you look at Turabi Sudan or Afghanistan under the Taliban or arguably, you know, the present group of people in Iran, how attractive yeah. is that? Yeah, I, I think your Cold War analogy is a good one. Uh, because in both cases, if indeed there is a kind of intrinsic vulnerability in, in our enemy, which is to say that they ultimately don't have a system that can work or, or, <laughs> and can be broadly appealing, then a certain amount of patience is called for. And it's always struck me, th th there was an irony about the Cold War, which is that if you had faith in, in the productive power of markets, you should have been confident that if we waited them out long enough and just pursued a, a policy of containment as opposed to rollback, we would win if you really had faith in the free enterprise system. And yet it was conservatives, by and large, who, were, who tended to be impatient and think, no, we need something more aggressive than containment. And there's an analogy uh, with, with the jihadist issue, which is that, um, you know, it's, an, it's, it's the neoconservatives who thought, no, we, we, you know, we can't just be patient and kind of, and kind of fight them on the margins. Uh, we've got to we've got to really really move in big time and aggressively and of course Iraq uh, is one result of that. But I, I think I, I think I never heard the analogy quite like that and I think it's a good one. Um, the uh, just one I'm curious what do you think of the term Islamo fascist? That that is uh, it's related to the clash of civilizations issue at least in the sense that it's attributing a unified world view to a lot of Muslim radicals around. The world. Does that term make sense to you? I'm not a huge fan of the term because, I mean, last time I checked, fascism was something to do with nationalism. And one thing that these groups don't, they all agree on one thing, is that national boundaries don't exist across the Muslim world. They are, and the other thing, I think, the dangerous part of the Paul Berman argument that we've seen this movie before, and it's basically another totalitarian ideology, uh, similar to communism or fascism. Again, I don't think that really is that very helpful because... The first things that communists and fascists do is they abolish God as an alternate power center. And totalitarian regimes don't want God involved or churches or mosques. Um, and I think, you know, it's a, misunder, a misunderstanding of what these people are about. These people are about a, um, you know, 7th century view of the world. that They really believe that they are, you know, fighting for the true Islam. It's got a lot to do with God. It's got very little to do with... Uh, totalitarianism. Sure, they use modern technologies and they're very happy to do them. So I, I'm not sure Islamofascism is that helpful. I, I, I think it's kind of a rather glib thing. I know that Christopher Hitchens was one of the first people to use it. Um, it may be helpful on one level, but as it, you know, when you really get into an analytical thing, uh, I'm not sure it's helpful. I mean, and it's very tempting, by the way, Bob, as you know, to sort of like, you know, try and ascribe things and to put them, put them into different, different. Uh, you know, pegs that we've sort of seen them before. You know, the, this is just very similar to something else that we dealt with. And I think that one of the reasons, I don't know, I've only met Berman once, but I mean, if you're a sort of 60s liberal, as I understand he once was, you know, it might be very appealing to see this only in Cold War terms uh, or, or very similar to what you saw in the 20th century. And I, I think this is just something, it's new and different. Obviously, there's no state behind it. I mean, last time I checked, fascism had something to do with states. Uh, these are non-state actors. Uh, they don't believe in national boundaries. It seems there are more differences than similarities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and the last question is an imponderable, and I doubt you'll have a clear <laughs> answer, but just in case. I mean, um, you know, one of the hardest 
kinds of questions to sort out is the kind of great man question in history, the role of individual people in history. Uh, and with bin Laden, it's tricky because on the one hand, clearly a lot of the currents he exploited were bubbling along before him and would have been without him. Uh, and people were talking about the importance of non-state actors uh, and the threat of terrorism, and there was clearly... On the other hand, he, he clearly brought the whole thing to a new level of prominence. Have you, have you given any thought to the question of what, you know, what if he hadn't been born or, or what? <laughs> no, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm... I'm, I'm sort of, I fall a little bit into the great man view of history. I, I think that, you know, um, it's very hard to explain the Holocaust without Hitler. It's very hard to, it's impossible to explain why the French were in Moscow in 1812 without Napoleon, I think. And, and I think the same thing can be said about bin Laden, Maimon al Zawari. And um, as we discover more documents uh, about bin Laden, uh, for instance, in the Musawi trial, fascinating 56 uh, summary of uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's interrogation, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed being the operational commander of 9 11. He describes this decision-making process in al-Qaeda as being almost dictatorial. There was a Shura conservative council. If 98% of them uh, felt one way and bin Laden felt the other way, it was bin Laden's way. So, you know, bin Laden ran this thing as a top-down organization. He came out of an economics and public administration background. His father had run a you know, big business. He ran it in a kind of rather top-down CEO style, uh, not like the Bush CEO, the CEO style. He turned out to be really hands-on. And so, um, you know, I don't think I would have bothered writing the book unless I felt that this guy had actually made some impact on history. Yes, there were these other things going on, the Islamic awakening in the Muslim world, uh, a fair amount of anti-Americanism. Uh, we've seen non-state actors, you know, become more important uh, on the terrorism front. But somebody needed to pull that all together, and that person needed charisma. He needed to, you know, a certain amount of personal courage. He needed leadership skills. Uh, and unfortunately, that all coalesced around bin Laden at a certain point. There were many things that could have gone differently. One of the subtexts of the 9-11 Commission report is that the 9-11 hijackers got lucky. Well, that's true, they got lucky, but history is made by lucky people. It's not made by, by unlucky people. Except, mm -hmm. And so I don't know how satisfactory that... You know, getting, getting deeper down to the question of what is this all about, you know, I, I've been trying to think about it fairly carefully, and... There are probably four or five really good explanations. One is bin Laden's personality and leadership. The other one is uh, we were collateral damage in a civil war that's going on in the Muslim world for how to organize Muslim states. I, Michael Scott Duran first proposed that. I think that's a very good uh, proposal. Uh, and there are others, which I'm writing about right now. But it, it's not, you know, this is not the death rattle of political Islam, as Olivier Roy and, uh, and Jill Keppel have suggested. Uh, this is not uh, a clash of civilizations, I don't think, as yet. Um, there are a lot of things it isn't. The question is trying to get down to what it, what it really was all about. And even five years after 9-11, I think we're just beginning to sort out. One, one of the good things is that we're sufficiently distant from the event that a lot of the nonsensical things that were said before, uh, as, right around 9-11, are no longer being said. I'm noticing the president himself no longer talks about us being attacked because of our freedoms. And in a state on the war, in a, he actually had a war, war on terrorism speech, which I think he should have delivered three years ago, in which he said we were being attacked by a group of people with this very militant, you know, Islamist, you know, Salafist philosophy. Uh, you know, it was kind of refreshing to hear, well, actually, that is the people who are, you know, rather than just sort of saying these people hate us and they're people with their turbans all askew because of how great we are. Um, you know, so the more nonsense, we have learned, I think, something in the last yeah. five years. No, it's too bad. You have to learn through your mistakes. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's the way life is. <laughs> yeah. um, well, listen, it's a great book, The Osama Bin Laden, I know, and you actually do come to know him a lot better. And uh, all you really, in fact, have to do to start that process is dip into it almost anywhere because that's kind of the way oral histories are. It just, um, it's just engrossing. Uh, but I do recommend uh, reading it from front to back. That's probably... A more, more, more coherent picture will emerge, but it, it's uh, really something you should be proud of, and I appreciate your, your taking the time. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you.